Hi, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the CRR event today. We appreciate everybody joining us for our discussion. I'm Matt Piotrowski with Climate Advisors, which is part of the CRR Consortium, along with Aid Environment and Profundo. And today we would like to welcome special guests from Envil Ver and Mighty Earth. Our focus today will be on the French company Casino Group and its Brazilian subsidiary GPA, both of which are facing allegations of non-compliance with French law. Research by various outlets, including Envil Ver and CRR, shows that GPA has purchased beef sourced from farms involved in illegal land clearing and encroachment on indigenous lands. Some of the meat sold in GPA stores has come from farms that saw approximately 4,500 hectares of forest cleared for cattle ranching. Under government scrutiny and pressure from civil society, Casino GPA and its financiers may face escalating financial risks. A few notes before we start on the main presentation. In our event today, there are three organizations and each organization will be presenting its own views and not necessarily the views of the others. Also, everyone in the audience is on mute but if you have any questions, you can type your questions into the Q&A and we will aim to answer them after our presentation. And now I'd like to hand it over to Bart Slob of Aid Environment to begin the main presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Matt. Uh, next slide, please. So um, today I'm going to give you a, a very quick summary about our findings on Casino and GPA. This is a piece of research we published in September uh, 2020. And we decided both to focus on GPA and Casino uh, because for us the entity is one and uh, they also present themselves as such in their communications. Um, According to its own data, Casino uh, was the top retail group in Brazil and Colombia in 2019. And we found that um, through uh, primary research and secondary research, we, we found that GPA was Brazil's second largest retailer in 2019, with a turnover of uh, 61.5 billion uh, Brazilian reais. That's about uh, 10.4 uh, US dollars. Uh, uh, 10.4 billion US dollars. Uh, what's also very interesting to say about GPA is that they employ a lot of people. They employ over 100,000 people uh, in uh, Brazil, and that's more than any retailer in Brazil. And it's also about half of the workforce uh, globally of casino. This uh, shows us how important and key GPA is to casino. In Brazil, uh, GPA operates through uh, two main business units, uh, Multivarejo and Açaí. Multivarejo covers supermarkets, hypermarkets, uh, neighborhood outlets, fuel stations, and drugstores, while Açaí operates the uh, cash and carry segment. In uh, June uh, 2019, GPO, GPA sold its entire stake in its former subsidiary, uh, Via Varejo which was a electronics and appliances retailer. Next slide, please. So based on our research on the origins and destination of uh, GPA beef products and an analysis of GPA's policies, uh, we have doubts about the effectiveness of GPA's and casinos approach to deforestation in their beef supply chains. And one of the reasons for this is that GPA relies on direct suppliers to monitor deforestation at indirect suppliers. And we feel that this approach exposes uh, GPA to increased risks in their indirect supply chain. Uh, GPA and Casino have had a uh, beef sourcing policy since March 2016. Uh, but we found that there has been a lack of regular and detailed updates on its implementation. Um, just before we send our report um, to the company uh, to, to check for uh, factual uh, mistakes, uh, we learned that uh, GPA uh, published a brand new social and environmental beef publishing, uh, purchasing policy. And 
of course, we thoroughly analyzed that as well, and, and, and it's, it's a significant improvement. It's more comprehensive than previous versions. But still, um, the policy lacks time-bound goals and specific timelines. Uh, the company in its new policy uh, says it finds it challenging to track illegal practices such as livestock laundering and uh, leakages. Um, and it also says that it's um, that um, tracing the origin of beef and monitoring indirect farms are still complex challenges for meatpacking plants, considering that there is a vast number of potential indirect farms in Brazil. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. Yeah. So, so we see uh, several risks in. Um, GPA and casinos uh, activities in Brazil, and we think these risks can affect performance negatively. We see that suppliers to slaughterhouses in Brazil have exposed GPA to deforestation and other sustainability risks. Uh, notwithstanding GPA's beef pol purchasing policy, uh, there are case studies that suggest that the company cannot guarantee that its direct suppliers are not exposed to deforestation. So I'm not only talking about indirect suppliers, but also direct suppliers. Uh, four of these cases are included in our September 2020 report on casino and GPA. Um, they've been picked because they represent different types of, uh, of um, problematic deforestation related to the production of beef in Brazil. Uh, they are, well, we, we'll talk about that later as well, Fazendo Elos, uh, which cleared two, 2,000, nearly 2,000 hectares of legal reserves and areas of permanent protection. Uh, Fazendo Bianchini, uh, involved in cattle laundering. Fazendo Lua Clara in the Cerrado, uh, ignored an Ibama uh, embargo, Ibama. Uh, and Fazenda J.E. or J.R., encroached on um, indigenous territory in Pará. So we see, uh, first of all, a regulatory um, risk because uh, there is a chance if casino is taken to court, it may lose a case over its compliance with the Devoir de Vigilance law. Uh, GPA and casino may be exposed to financing risk as investors call for mitigating illegal deforestation in Brazil. And finally, we also see a reputation uh, risk because uh, the reputation impacts from perceived legal risk may further worsen the financing risk uh, for casino and GPA. And any reputational repercussions from a perceived risk of litigation will likely heighten the company's risk re perception among investors and further increase the cost of capital. Thank you, uh, over to Gerard. Yes, thank you, uh, Bart. Um, well, as, uh, um, as Bart, Bart explained, the types of risks that we are looking at at uh, chain reaction uh, research, we also try to add a value to these uh, types of risk. And in the case of uh, casino and GPA, we see three uh, types and uh, uh, of risks, and we see three we see three escalating scenarios in this in these uh, in these risks. If you look to the to to the level one of risk, uh, the first level of risk it's the uh, adaptation in the supply chain. So in the, it, to bring it in line with the due diligence uh, law intentions. Um, and if we would move to a uh, best-in-class situation at, uh, at Casino Group, um, then that might cost quite some millions of US dollars. And as a reference, we have used our analysis uh, made by Chain Reaction Research of the palm oil business, where we saw a best-in-class uh, palm oil uh, monitoring and verification outcome for Unilever, which was around uh, US dollar 66 million, which was, and that's what you can see in the um, in the table uh, at uh, at uh, at the left end of the slide. Uh, that was 11% for the palm oil sourced by value of the palm oil sourced by by Unilever. 
Um, if we take this 66 million as a reference also for, 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 for casino, that would mean around 3% of the cost of the beef sourcing. So only 3%. So that is a relatively limited number. However, because of the low level of, uh, of profits at uh, GPA and of casino, mainly caused by the financing cost by the high debt, uh, this is quite a high percentage of the uh, net profit of GPA, around 31%, and for casino, um, around 8%. But this is all in the assumption that they will not pass on it to, uh, to customers. Normally, uh, supermarket chains pass this kind of costs. Uh, so higher sourcing cost often means higher sales costs, and then uh, the impact on the total profits can be quite, uh, quite, uh, quite, quite minimal. Um, level two, uh, apart from the outcome of the legal case, the finances, banks, and bond investors, uh, they are increasingly uh, looking for uh, ESC related loans. Um, and it means that uh, um, if the, uh, uh, that the cost of capital, the cash cost of capital uh, can increase if, if, if a company is not executing its due diligence related to deforestation um, in a right way. And I come back later on, these, uh, on the cost of this. And we have a level three, and that is much more uh, affecting the shareholders' value. Uh, so not the bonds and, 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 and banks, but it's, that's the shareholders. That's another type of, of financer. Um, and for the, for the shareholders, mainly the reputation risk uh, might affect uh, the value because it could increase the cost of equity. Uh, next slide, please. Um, if we look to the, to the level two, uh, higher cash financing costs because the interest rate rates might move up. And that is all related to increasing legislation, increasing ESG policies uh, at, uh, at financiers. And if we look to the uh, financing of the uh, casino group companies, uh, including GBA, then you can see that uh, French investors are quite important. For this, uh, for, for this group, that is around in total, the grand total is 36%. And if you look to the European, all the European investors, uh, that's even around 60%. And in, in, in particular, uh, as you can see in underwriting loans and in bonds, uh, European finances are quite, uh, are quite dominant. Well, in this higher cash financing cost, if uh, if, if, the, if the casino does not have the right policies, happens in an environment where the net debt EBITDA ratios are already deteriorated already for casino and GPA in the last three years. Uh, companies have in their financing become much more dependent on, on debt. And at the same time, of course, this uh, higher debt uh, dependence gives a lot of engagement opportunities for, 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 for banks on uh, things like deforestation. Um, if you look to the level three, the reputation risk, which is affecting much more the shareholders, uh, there we have two methodologies. One is, uh, is, 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 is explained in the report uh, of, uh, of chain reaction research. Here you can see the, the link to that, to that report. And that might have an impact uh, if there's a structural weak approach to a string of ESG events. Uh, events of 3 to 29%. Uh, another methodology, uh, we use the relative PE, relative uh, uh, enterprise value EBITDA, relative valuation multiples. And if we look to the relative uh, uh, price earnings ratio, then there is also quite some downside is left if this is not handled well by casino and by the GPA entities. Next slide, please. Now, this is a summary. Um, well, in, in fact, what we, see, what, what we see here, if we have a best-in-class option, that would be by far the best for, 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 for casino and GPA, a best-in-class 
uh, due diligence uh, approach by, 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 by the group of companies. And that could impact the, uh, the market cap by 70 to 22%. But again, here, um, if, they if, if they do this right, they can pass it on to, to consumers. And uh, uh, then the impact of 70 to 22% can be, uh, can be, uh, can be uh, uh, reduced substantially. Um, if the company takes no action, no, no better due diligence, no better monitoring verification, then, uh, well, there's a low chance that only the, uh, only the cash, that, 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 that only the French investors might, might raise their interest uh, rates a bit, um, or that the reputation is uh, relatively le uh, minimal, the reputation risk value. Um, however, we think that in case of no action, there is a high chance that these impacts will be much larger, that there might be a relatively high impact on the, uh, on the interest rates of maybe 100, 100 base points that could lead to this high number of 160, 161 million. The reputation value risk for the shareholders can be substantial. Uh, this this can, can all add up to 66% of the equity value of GPA and 83% of Casino Group. So that's quite quite substantial. So with this, I like to hand over to Illy. Hello everyone. So I'm Eli from the uh, Envolver organization. Uh, Envolver is a French organization that has been uh, focusing on halting deforestation and protecting forests and biodiversity in the world since its creation in 2011. Um, for us, forests are really important as they provide numerous uh, services to the world. Uh, next slide, please. They uh, participate in uh, water reg reg regulation, sorry, also climate regulation. Um, but uh, actually, uh, forests are highly threatened by human activities all around the world. Uh, the numbers spoke from themselves, as you can see the first one, 10 million hectares of deforestation per year in the past five years uh, in regards of uh, FAO stats. Um, but uh, deforestation um, is still one of the main environmental issues in the world and the destruction of these ecosystems are, have catastrophic uh, consequences all over the world, such as a, a huge loss of biodiversity and an increase in the global warming. Thus, at Envolver, we think that it is ur urgent to protect existing forests by halting the ongoing deforestation. As we are present in South America, in Colombia and Peru, we decided to focus on the main deforestation vector in this region, which is the cattle sector. So now I'll briefly present the cattle sector in Brazil. Next slide, please. So uh, Brazil, Brazil is the second largest uh, beef producer in the world. Uh, last year, it produced around 10 million tons of uh, carcass weight equivalent. Uh, um, um, not a, the, the first one, sorry, is the USA, but uh, Brazil is quite different as most of the meat produced lo is consumed locally. So uh, it varies around 80% of all the meat produced, which is consumed locally. As there is deforestation in the supply chain, all the actors present in the supply chain from the production up to the distribution and to the consumer are responsible of uh, this deforestation. Um, the uh, supply chain is quite complex. On the right side of the slide, you can see a, a quick uh, figure representing the supply chain. So it can be divided in two parts. The first one being the, uh, during the life of the animal and the second one in the uh, slaughtering, transformation and distribution. As you can see, there are numerous actors. In the first part, we have the breeding and rearing farm and then the fattening farms. Which, are, which can be considered as the direct farms as they are the ones selling the live animals directly to the slaughterhouse. Then on the second part, we have the slaughterhouse who are major actors, such as Jiggers or Marfrig or Minerva. 
um, those plants uh, slaughter the animal, then transform it into fresh meat or frozen meat, and then sell it to the retailers who then distribute it in the country to the consumers. Which is important to know, and what has already been said, is that the two leaders of distribution in Brazil are French companies, so the group Casino and the group Carrefour, both of them having around 15% of the market share. Another interesting fact on the group Casino is that uh, they are also uh, extremely present in Colombia, as they are the leader as well there with a subsidiary uh, Exito, and they have around 47% of the market share. Uh, some researchers studied the deforestation in supply chain and presented the fact that there is around 59% of all the deforestation present on the indirect farms. This is uh, an important point, but I will come back to it later. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the investigation uh, took place uh, during one year in Brazil. Uh, we were not the first one to do so. We uh, based ourselves on the previous investigation made by Chain Reaction, Chain Reaction Research, sorry. And we uh, partnered up with Reporter Brazil, who are uh, investigation journalists. Um, in order, the goal of this investigation was quite easy. It was to obtain proof of the link between recent deforestation and other uh, issues with products sold directly in the casino stores in Brazil. To do so, we divided it uh, into two steps, sorry. The first one being linking the product to the slaughterhouse. Here, we choose two approach. The first one being collecting information on samples in the casino stores. So we uh, uh, took 130 products in 10 different stores in order to collect the information such as the CIF or the CNPG numbers, which are in, then enable us to find the slaughterhouse where the products came from. This approach is mainly focusing on the national brands. And for the own brands who belong to Casino, we decided to interview two butcher shelves in, the, uh, in some extra stores in Cuiaba. Um, this, those approach uh, then uh, gave us the name and location of the slaughterhouse where the products came from. And then we can uh, move on to the second phase, which is linking those slaughterhouse to the direct and then indirect farms, and then cross those information in order to find some deforestation or other issues. So in order to do so, we use various methods and some verification, of course, but we mostly use the cadaster, the Brazilian rural cadaster, which is the car, which gives us the location and form of the farms, and the GTA, which is the Guia de Transport Terminal, which allows us to uh, link the different farms and the transfer of animals between farms and slaughterhouses. Once we have those information, we then cross it with various lists, such as the uh, produce and deter alert, which may which gave us the amount of deforestation. And we also cross it with the uh, gov gov government uh, list, such as the embargo area or the slavery and forced labor. Next slide, please. Thanks. So uh, the main results of uh, this investigation is that we did prove the, the existence of deforestation inside the supply chain of Casino. And uh, which is quite important is that even by uh, controlling only 130 products and two stores, we were able to find at least four farms, which round up as uh, Bart said at the beginning, around 4,500 4, hectares of illegal deforestation. But it's not only deforestation. We also found some indigenous land invasion, which is a social crime. And uh, the important fact is that deforestation was found in indirect farm, but also in direct farm. As I was saying, this is quite important as the casino group has been, uh, as Bart said, having a, a sustainable policy of cattle purchase since 2016, where they should have been controlling all their direct suppliers. And as we can see here, this is not the case. So there's, there is a lack of control from casino. 
Uh, last point is the results from Colombia. Even if we did not investigate, we have information that trustability in Colombia is less stronger than in Brazil, and thus there is higher risk and higher chance of finding deforestation in Colombia. Next slide, please. So here is a, a wrap up of all the information. As you can see, we group up different cases that we found of deforestation. Uh, as you can see, we also uh, presented the Fazendaelus, uh, which is important here is noting that not only did we present cases of uh, our investigation, but we, we also used um, information from other tools, such as the um, MyCheerF tool, uh, rapid response, or the investigation from uh, the Guardian. This is to show you that there is a huge number of uh, organization or journalist uh, implique, implique, uh, uh, having eyes on this issue. And what we presented in our report is only the tip of the iceberg. There is much more deforestation inside the supply chain and it is well known from now on. I will now uh, let Etel present the litigation against the casino. Thanks everyone. Thank you so much, Eli. So I'm going to dive in and talk about the legal action that has been undertaken by a consortium of indigenous groups and NGOs, which was alluded to earlier. Um, and it's a devoir de vigilance case, which literally translates as duty of vigilance case. And we feel that this case is extremely important as an individual case, but also as a marker of other cases that could be brought, all of which combined are raising risks for investors when their portfolios do not address deforestation and indigenous rights and other human rights abuses in their supply chains. So can we go to the next slide, please? I'll just give a quick overview of the devoir de vigilance law. It is a new French law. It's really revolutionary and quite heroic in a way. It's a new law that requires the biggest companies present in France to take appropriate measures to address three things, serious human rights violations, environmental harms, and health harms. And not only do they need to be transparent about the harms, in their supply chain, identifying them and being transparent about them. They also need to take steps to mitigate those harms and be transparent about how they're mitigating those harms. And I'll just say a couple words about the size of the companies. If it is a French company, in essence, the threshold for whether a company is bound by the law or not is 5,000 employees. If it's an international company with presence in France, the threshold is 10,000 employees. This is important because we're really looking at a situation where it's not a gotcha game going after small mom and pop stores. This is a law that's designed to make some of the biggest and most powerful companies in the world accountable for their actions in France and beyond. I should emphasize, and beyond, because this is a law that really holds up a new standard of behavior for international companies that are large and based in France and for big French companies in all their direct and indirect supply chains worldwide, including, for example, their indirect supply chain in Brazil that Eli was alluding to and in Colombia. So just to dig in a little bit more on the duty of vigilance law. It's revolutionary because it doesn't only look at companies' own operations and activities. It also encompasses human rights abuses, environmental abuses, and health harms in the supply chains of subsidiaries, suppliers, and subcontractors. So just speaking about the casino case, this means that the actions of slaughterhouses like JBS, Chateau BS, as well as the Marfrig and Minerva, of course, 
would be at stake. So this is a pioneering law that allows the French legal system to halt harms around the world, like, for example, the Amazon destruction that Eli spoke about, which is so catastrophic, really the lungs of our planet being destroyed. This allows the French law to prescribe necessary measures to halt that kind of catastrophic destruction by French companies or destruction that winds up in French companies' supply chains and to repair damages suffered. That's very important, repairing damages suffered by victims. Let's go to the next slide, please. Okay, let's just quickly talk about the penalties that are um, found in this devoir de vigilance law. There was quite a bit of tension around the question of penalties during parliamentary debates. And the law went up to the French Conseil Constitutionnel, which is the constitutional court, which reviewed the law. It found the law to be A-OK, -okay, but it did remove one part of that law, um, the part about the civil fine, which had been quite specific. So now what we know with this new law is that there are two penalties. Number one, there's periodic penalty payments, which are called astreintes, and number two, there's civil liability action, which in French is responsabilité civile. And periodic penalty payments are basically fines that are payable on a daily basis or a per event basis until a defendant would satisfy the given obligations. And it's really important to just come back to the point of the law because that will be a factor in handing out any penalties. The goal of the law is clearly stated to obtain remediation for victims where damages are sustained. Let's go to the next slide. So, um, one of the things that's important to note is that many organizations came together in the context of this case. We have a number of organizations in France, um, as well as the United States, and a number of indigenous rights groups. So, Mighty Earth is based in Washington, D.C., but in France, the NGOs that joined this case are Envol Vert, where Elie is from, and also Notre Affaire à tous, Canopé, Sherpa. And then in um, both Brazil and in Colombia, this case was joined by indigenous organizations, OPIAC in Colombia, and in Brazil, COYAB, FEPOINT, and FEPIPA. But in Brazil, we also have an NGO that joined us, which is CPT. It's the Comissão Pastoral da Terra. They're very focused on slavery in the beef supply chain. So all these groups came together, and I think that's a testament to the gravity of the case and to the importance of straightening out what happens in retailers, as Eli pointed out. We're really looking at a situation where 80% of the beef in Brazil, much of which is driving deforestation and ecosystem conversion, is consumed in Brazil. And 80% of that consumption is in supermarkets. And the top two supermarkets in Brazil are French. So I think there's just a tremendous awareness in civil society in France, in Brazil, in Colombia, in the United States, that the French supermarkets need to clean up their act. And I'll also point out that um, the third biggest supermarket in Brazil, also essentially an international supermarket, used to be Walmart and has recently been sold to another US um, buyer. Next slide, please. So this was all laid out before, but I think it's worth just repeating the top line points about the impact. We know cattle ranching is the top driver of forest loss in Latin America and specifically in the Brazilian Amazon. This is the lungs of our planet. That's just not really an acceptable outcome. Number two, we know that Casino Pau de Azúcar Grupo Éxito, which has the different names in the different places, is one of the biggest supermarket groups in France, as well as the biggest retailer in Colombia and in Brazil. We also know that all large French companies and financial institutions are now on notice. This law is real and we're very serious about holding them accountable for respecting this law. So that's just situating the top line impacts. Now let's talk about the top line goals. 
Our main purpose in starting this legal action is to call on Casino to exclude beef that is tainted by deforestation and land grabbing of indigenous territories from all its supply chains. And that's legal deforestation and illegal deforestation. We're not in a situation where either one of those is acceptable anymore. We're hurtling towards catastrophic climate change and zero deforestation means zero deforestation. The second thing is we really need Casino and in fact, all big French companies to take responsibility for their suppliers, including suppliers like JBS. It's the biggest meat company in the world and it has been found to be responsible for and have its products tainted by legal deforestation, illegal deforestation, indigenous land grabbing, slavery, other forms of labor abuse, and other forms of human rights violations, as well as burning. So we're asking Casino and all other big French companies to take responsibility for their suppliers, all meat suppliers that are driving deforestation and rights abuses. One of the most important ways to do that is to bring traceability and transparency to their supply chains. That's something that Amy had alluded to, is this problem of cattle laundering. Cattle laundering, moving cows that are in the indirect supply into the direct supply chain. And those cattle that are in the indirect supply chain are much more frequently tied to all kinds of problematic human rights, health, and environmental practices. So we need to end cattle laundering in all supply chains. And then the last top line goal was reserving the right to seek compensation for any resulting damages particularly for indigenous people whose rights have been affected. Next slide, please. Just do a little dive into the detailed demands. When we talk about increasing traceability, what does that mean? That really means full traceability of direct supply ASAP, but it also means cracking the tough nut of traceability with indirect suppliers. The other thing is, we're talking, of course, about multiple at-risk biomes. Deforestation for cattle is not limited to the Brazilian Amazon. It's particularly egregious in the Brazilian Amazon, but it is also a problem in Colombia, in the Cerrado, which is the Brazilian term for savanna. About half the Cerrado is already gone now. And that ecosystem, which is a savanne arborée, uh, a, a treed savanna, is extremely important for regulating the hydrological cycle of Brazil. Many of the rivers and indeed a lot of the hydropower of Brazil finds its source in the Cerrado. So as we destroy the Cerrado, we're also destroying the water system of Brazil. And another high risk biome is the Pantanal. I could go on. There's the Bolivian Amazon, which is also at risk for deforestation for cattle. And of course there's the Chaco in um, both Paraguay and in Argentina. We also need the scope of the policy to encompass both the products and the brands that are obvious, but also transformed products. So all products and all brands. Let's move on to direct control of suppliers. We really cannot have a situation where a company like Casino is delegating control of its suppliers to a company like JBS, the world's largest meat company, which is notorious for both deforestation and human rights violations and grossly inadequate supply monitoring. It is not okay to delegate that vital responsibility to actors who have clearly forfeited their right to be responsible for this because of their incompetence. Um, so we need direct control of compliance of all suppliers, no delegation of this control to slaughterhouses, and we can't have a situation where it's the fox patrolling the hen house. We need independent third party audits. The situation is very bad. You know, we have to have a, a real reckoning with the lack of responsibility that's been demonstrated over time. If you can't be responsible, then someone else has to supervise you. 
So independent third party audits are vital. And let's be real, engagement is just not really enough at this point. For the last decade, we've heard, oh, engagement this, engagement that. I'm sorry, but at this point, we need to have suspensions of non-compliant suppliers, even of big slaughterhouses, particularly in high-risk biomes, right? The whole idea that you can just talk it over is, is not acceptable. You can't talk over indigenous rights abuses and illegal deforestation. These are not things that we can have just protracted endless engagement over. We need suspensions. The last thing I'll dive into is the zero deforestation policy. This is very important. We're getting into the nitty gritty here, but we need specific cutoff dates for all the biomes with realistic objectives, milestones, and periodic evaluations. That kind of rounds it out for the detailed demands. Next slide, please. I'll just close out my presentation by saying that it's not only the plaintiffs, the co-plaintiffs, that are in this case that recognize how vital it is and that came together because we all understand how important this is. It's also the global news media. We, when we filed our mise en demeure, which is the first piece of um, uh, legal paperwork that kicks off the legal process for this case, the Devoir de Vigilance case, we received 106 pieces of media coverage, um, TV, radio, print, in France, in Brazil, and beyond. I think that's really a testament to how um, the global news media does recognize that this is a vital case. And just to come back to what Gerard and Bart were saying, this raises up the reputational risk for this company in particular and for this legal case. Um, but it also, I think, raises reputational risks that could be um, considered to be looming in the offing for other companies that are at the threshold of the world of vigilance. So thank you very much. And I'll stop there and hand it back over to our moderator. Great, thank you so much. And thanks to all the panelists. And we now have some time for Q&A. And um, so if you have any questions, please type it into the Q&A chat. And for the first one, uh, Atel, um, the follow up on something um, that you were discussing regarding legal and illegal deforestation. Um, the Brazilian code, uh, when reviewed in 2012, offered a waiver to deforestation previous to 2008. Um, so in a certain way, the, the questioner asks, all farms in Brazil were deforestated at some point in history. Are you proposing a time frame for deforestation that should be cleared from casinos supply chain? Yes. Just to be clear, what we're really talking about here is a French company, Casino, and it is bound by a French law, the Devoir de Vigilance law. That law is very specific no environmental harms, no human rights harms, no health harms. So unless a company bound by that law wants to be hors la loi, outside the law, a lawbreaker, that means no environmental harms. Last time I checked, deforestation, whether legal or illegal, is an environmental harm. This means we're very serious about asking casino to end all their deforestation, legal and illegal, as of the time that the French law was passed. But I think we can also go into the different questions of the cutoff dates for the specific biomes, with one being for the Amazon in Brazil and one being for the Cerrado. There are, of course, questions about cutoff dates that should be in place for the Chaco and for Bolivia. Um, and that's a a sort of pack of complex questions that a casino does need to address and live up to a best-in-class policy. And Ili, I don't know if you'd like to also comment on the question about the cutoff dates. Sure. Um, I do think that there is a existing cutoff dates, but they are really specific on uh, one biome. What we ask is that there is some new cutoff dates, but for all the biomes where casino is present and where deforestation happened, 
for example, for now, I, 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 if I remember well, I think 2008 or 2009 is the cutoff date for the Amazon biome, but there is no existing cutoff date for the Cerrado, for the Pantanal, and all the other ecosystem. And as uh, Gustavo Pinheiro uh, asked in his question, those cutoff data are really important, as you say, to put on the framework for what we, what we consider as deforestation or not. I'll just I'll just say it one more time because it bears repeating and I see a question has popped up about this for casino and for all French companies like Carrefour and others it doesn't really matter anymore whether there isn't a cutoff date officially for beef in the Cerrado and other at-risk biomes their cutoff date is the French law they're a French company they're bound by a French law that means no deforestation not legal deforestation not illegal deforestation, no human rights violations, that means no slavery, no indigenous rights land grabbing, all of that stuff is over as of the time that the law was passed. That's what it means to have a law. Great, uh, thank you for that. Thank you for the clarifications. A um, uh, couple other questions for the groups. Do all Brazilian consumers of beef um, face the same risks from indirect suppliers as GPA? And are there companies that don't have the same amount of risk with indirect suppliers? I can chime in a little bit on this question of the level of risk for different Brazilian companies. Uh, Chain Reaction Research has of course done a wonderful scorecard that lists, or maybe not a scorecard, but a chart that lists the um, exposure of certain companies to fires, how close their silos and slaughterhouses are to fires, and Mighty Earth has also done that work. So we can clearly see that certain companies that are operating in Brazil and elsewhere have a much higher risk associated with their product of both fires and of deforestation. For example, Bunky has just a much, much, much higher fire footprint and deforestation footprint than, for example, Louis Dreyfus company, which has a much lower fire and deforestation footprint. The same is true for the beef companies as well. JBS has an exceptionally high fire and deforestation footprint and has been involved in numerous um, corruption scandals and extreme human rights violations, including slavery. Um, so there's, of course, a lot of risk to go around. Many Brazilian companies do have risk in their supply chains, but there's certainly a hierarchy. Some companies have far more risk and far more abuses in their supply chain. And I'll just say it again, because it bears repeating, JBS is top of the line. And Casino is sourcing from JBS. So this is a real problem. Does anyone else want to uh, chime in on that question? Yes, maybe if you allow me, uh, Matt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for, for us, we look at risks for investors mainly, and uh, we see an increased risk at Casino because Casino is precisely based in France, and France has a stronger uh, regulatory framework than, than many other countries uh, with regard to uh, human rights violations and deforestation and precisely this uh, due diligence law what it is 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 a law that um, yeah, sort of requires companies to do research in their supply chains and map risks now other countries are making progress in uh, in on this topic as well there are other countries that have proposals uh, to start monitoring this. There's, uh, there's for example, initiative in, in the UK, in Australia, in the Netherlands on, on child labor. But yeah, the, the, the facts of the matter is that France has this strong regulatory environment and therefore we do see an increased risk for casino in France. And this would also go for other French uh, major retailers.
Over Great, thanks, Bart. Yeah. yeah. Um, so there's a question about, um, Atel, you see the question of, um, about Thank paying you. for a call. So, yeah, I see yes, a sorry. question from Francisco Neto to all the panelists. I would yes, like to yeah, know what kind yeah. of solutions can be put in place right now to reduce, eliminate risk, and what are the contributions that these organizations are proposing from their side, and then also who will pay for losses that would affect property owner? What are the costs, essentially? So I could break those down, and I think also Eli and, and Bart and Gerard might have some answers as well. The first thing is it's a complete fantasy that every time you go for no deforestation, people lose money. That's actually just not true. Um, and what we see very clearly, specifically in Brazil, where the Grupo de Trabalho de Soja established a no deforestation moratorium for soy from the Brazilian Amazon biome, that deforestation for soy plunged from around 30% to around 1%, and it has been hovering around that very low level for 11 years. So we see that there's just a tremendous transformation towards very close to no deforestation soy in the Brazilian Amazon. And in that same time, productivity doubled and profitability more than doubled. You all can correct me if I'm wrong, but that is the word on the street. Profitability doubled and productivity doubled. So we clearly see, even in Brazil, even in a commodity that's very closely tied to beef, because often you'll see that um, land speculation is followed by cattle, uh, deforestation for cattle is followed by soy. We'll see that even in, in, in Brazil, even in the Amazon, no deforestation is absolutely compatible with production, high production, improved production, and improved profitability. So I would just like to debunk that fantasy because it is a fantasy. And then the second thing I was going to say is what kind of solutions can be put in place to reduce and eliminate risk? Well, we've alluded to them. The kind of research that Eli did, the kind of tracing that you see with Visipac, for example, these are the tools that help you eliminate deforestation and rights abuses from your supply chains. We know how to do them. We have them. Visipac is up and running. It's just a question of bringing it to scale and for companies to want to expand the existing tools that are already at our disposal to scale. I'll stop there. Okay, great. Uh, thanks for that. Atel, uh, we have time for one last question. And um, this is about a, um, another French company, Carrefour. And the question is, where do they stand in regards to the vigilance law and why have they not been investigated so far? Because they operate in um, Brazil too. We're looking very closely at the Carrefour case. Carrefour, like Casino, is present in Brazil. They are one of the largest supermarkets in Brazil. They're also one of the largest supermarkets in Europe. They are also, just like Casino, bound by the devoir de vigilance law, and there are a number of steps that we expect them to take in the near future. So we're also looking at the Carrefour case. Okay, great. Thanks for that. And thanks for, again, to all the panelists for a great conversation today. We appreciate everybody uh, tuning in. We will have a recording on our website probably within the next 24 hours and we expect to share it on social media and through our email distribute list. So thanks again for coming and we hope to have another um, event sometime soon. Thank you. Bye thanks. everybody. Bye. Thank you very much.